This conference will now be recorded. Hi everyone. My name is Raven Hutto and for the next five to ten minutes I'm going to discuss Pit Crew Focus CPR. Uh, Pit Crew Focus CPR is something that we at Wake County um, with whom I work for have been doing since about 2017 or so maybe a little before maybe a little after I'm not I can't remember off too well. Um, it came to be because back in 2016 a study was done with 444 patients who suffered out-of-hospital cardiac arrest um, and they had manual CPR and mechanical CPR, either or, done on them. We discovered through that study that people who received manual CPR had a higher propensity for surviving um, to discharge than patients that had mechanical CPR. Okay, so in knowing that, how do we do better manual CPR? Uh, prior to pit crew focus CPR, we were running our codes with code commanders, and the fire department would do CPR. We would leave everything up to up to them, not not say anything bad about them, um, and we wouldn't really focus on one role. We would be code commander. However, we would also be ensuring that airway was done correctly. Um, that we were giving medication. Sometimes we were the ones that would maintain the access. Um, there was just too much going on. It was too chaotic with too, with too much of a myriad of things to do. A longhand pit crew CPR. Um, and this is a very position driven um, model with an emphasis on communication. So each position will communicate with the other position, um, with other positions around them. However, you know exactly what your role is. You know that if you're position one, what position one does, two, three, four, you know the next incoming ambulance is going to do this or this, and that is what their role is going to be. And it is a phenomenal change, and it's so much easier to handle. So here's the model. Um, and the model, the blue positions over here, the BLS positions are covered by the fire department um, or your first responders. The red positions are your EMS positions. Um, one and two come in on the first ambulance, three and four come in on the second ambulance. So position one is a paramedic position. That is what um, the person who handles the monitor only. You, you as a paramedic will come in as position one and verify whether the patient has a pulse or not. If the fire department says no, they didn't have a pulse last we checked, you just doubly make sure, put the pads on, put the pads on them. Um, you hook the pads into the monitor, Check the rhythm real quick. For example, let's say the patient's in V-fib. Patient's in V-fib. All right. So continue compressions. We will charge the monitor. Once the monitor's charged, stop compressions, clear, clear. Defib the patient, back on the chest for CPR. Um, also, what position one does is they verify, um, they do continuous pulse checks on the patient. They will maintain their finger on a femoral or carotid, some pulse in the core to make sure that effective CPR is still being done, um, whether there is a spontaneous return of a pulse at pulse checks. Then there's position two. Position two comes in on the first arriving ambulance and they are, um, this position can be covered by EMT, AEMT, or paramedic. And they're at the head so they can see everything. Um, and they are the ones that will ensure that effective CPR is being done. They will uh, check for depth of CPR, positioning of the hands for CPR, as well as the rate of the CPR. And if these things aren't being done correctly, then they will point it out, hey, you know, can you just increase your rate a little bit? Fantastic. Um, you know, oh, shift your hands a little bit over to the right. There you go. Fantastic. Um, and that they will also help manage the airway with BLS position three. BLS position three should already have a BVM with a BLS adjunct in place. And position two, EMS position two will go, okay, I'm gonna drop a king. Um, this patient, you know, they'll identify whether this patient needs to be intubated or have another ALS airway done. And they'll talk with position one to arrange that for the next oncoming crew to handle. Um, position three, EMS position three comes in, and this is my favorite one. 
uh, it's a paramedic position and they do access and medications. So this person will come in, they will obtain an IV or an IO or any combination of those, and they will start giving um, medications by talking with position one. So your last rhythm was uh, VF. Okay, we are going to give Epi 1 to 10. Then I'm going to go ahead and get 300 milligrams of Amio. And uh, they will, you know, okay, position one says they're also diabetic and blood sugar is 34. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and hang D10 as well. They're diabetic. So let's um, go ahead and give them bicarb and calcium on top of that. Uh, so they will communicate with position one um, and position four as well once position four gets all the medications to try and figure out what ALS um, interventions uh, in regards to chemical therapies and whatnot this patient needs, whereas position one will handle all the electrical therapies. Position four, which I think is the most difficult position to have because it involves a very real humanistic aspect of this patient. This patient now through position four has a name. They have a date of birth, they have a family. So position four is usually done by the provider with the most experience. Um, they talk to the family, they explain to the family what's going on, they explain to friends, bystanders, um, and they discuss what the further wishes of the patient would be um, or whatnot if the rest isn't going as well as we would hope. Um, or hospital destination, you know, whether it's going to be a PCI center, whatever one it's going to be for that patient, depending on where you're at. Um, they also do the checklist. The checklist is in the back of the monitor. It is also in a protocol book, and it is a bunch of different bullet points that make sure that we, as the providers in position one, two, and three, are performing everything that absolutely has to be done um, as effectively as possible in that cardiac arrest. So there's the post-resuscitation and the pre-resuscitation checklists. Um, you know, make sure you have double uh, access points, that you've been given all the medications, that you've defib correctly, that the pads are on correctly, that you have in title place. Um, you know, all these different things. Are you doing CPR um, at 120? Are you rotating out compressors every two minutes? What now like that? Make sure nobody's getting too tired. So as you can see, PICRU CPR is a very effective way to work one of the hardest calls that we do. It takes a lot of the, the thinking out of where you need to be to get something done and puts it into, while well, you're here, this is what you do. So here you go. And I hope that that um, was a little educational. Thanks.